My name is uh, Ken Crutch, Crutch with a K, um, and um, I'm the um, founder of a digital design agency called Crutch.com. We have a small group of designers and developers. We focus on building, yeah, all, it's just for the camera, it doesn't, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, we focus on building uh, commercial applications. We sort of stay away from things like dating apps and whatnot, and we do things in healthcare. Uh, we have a lot of experience doing enterprise storage and networking and stuff like that. So we have kind of a specialized practice that way. And what I want to talk about today is what I call Everywhere UX. And this is sort of somewhat a presentation for people who are not UX practitioners. Who in here is a UX practitioner? Awesome. That's good. Who in here is a software developer? You're the audience for this thing. Okay. I spent a lot of years as a software developer and then moved into this area, and I still am constantly running into software teams that don't really get any help on the UX side, whether it's for budget, belief, whatever. Um, this presentation, to be honest with you, is developed to, to, to convince management teams like yours that you need some help, but if you can't get the help, here are some things that you guys can do to DIY it. Okay, so sounds like I have the right audience for this. All right, so I'm going to have a, like a big pile of slides, and I'm going to stand here and read every slide verbatim, one after another. Okay? And that's kind of what that meeting turns into. <laughs> and I use that sort of dumb example as that people form expectations based on past experiences. If you take one thing away from this entire presentation, it's successful user experience design comes from understanding the mental model of the person that's going to use your product or service and getting them to that place as quickly as you possibly can with the principle of least astonishment, the fewest surprises. Don't build something that looks like a dating app and it's a finance app, right? You'll confuse your users, okay? I mean, you laugh, but we, we see apps all the time that you think, for example, is a banking app, and they've gotten a little too cute with it, you know, with like a little puppy dog and stuff like that. And it, it doesn't fit with the model that you have in your head of, hey, this is something serious. This is a banking app, and I want, it to, I want this to look serious. Who can tell me what these objects are? I'm sorry, what? It's a good guess. Now what are they? They're salt shakers. This is another example of fitting quickly into that mental model. You could take any two objects, I mean, on Earth, and put them together and have one with maybe one hole and one with three or five holes, and everybody would go salt and pepper shakers. Which one's the salt shaker? Anyone? Which, whichever? Is this salt or pepper? Salt. Interesting. And that's, most people think this is pepper? Yeah. So, it, you know what? I've discovered using a similar example to this over the years, it depends on where you're from, how you were raised, right? I was raised in a household where this was pepper and this was salt. Why? Because no one in my family used pepper. They just put tons of salt on everything and it comes out of here faster. Right? Anyway, it was a shock to me the first time I, I used this example. And uh, someone said, no, 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 you've got that wrong. And this is the cover to a book um, called Living with Complexity by Donald Norman. Who here has heard of Donald Norman? Yeah, just about a lot of people. And his um, partner, Jacob Nielsen, together, Nielsen and Norman are pretty much considered the, the founding fathers, if you will, of, of modern user experience design. And they have a website called nng.com which I cannot more highly recommend, especially if you're doing DIY UX. They have tons and tons of studies, white papers, anything you can imagine. There's limitless material there. And uh, it's a great site. I go there all the time. And uh, the interesting thing that he said about usability, it's the degree to which users can perform a set of required tasks. And I'm here to tell you from 20 plus years of doing this, that is the only test that matters, okay? 
the I think it's cool, it makes me feel good, blah, 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 those are all very interesting and they're important. But if they can't do the task that user needs to get done, everything else is worthless. Okay? And only by attending to the details does usability emerge as a dominant property. Usability is not a thing you do at the end. It's not a thing you just do at the beginning either. It is a myriad of things that you have to pay attention to deal, uh, uh, pay attention to that all come together and create a usable, fun product. And Don Norman also said, you know, we don't really want simplicity, and how can we learn to live with complexity? Uh, I have just eliminated the word simple from my vocabulary, I really have, because it has such a loaded meaning. We don't want things that are simple. <coughs> Everybody here drive a car? Really, there are people here that don't drive a car? <laughs> Come on. You, you, you probably, unless you've like worked on cars, or you like maybe took auto shop in high school and that sort of thing, you don't really appreciate how complex cars are. They are extremely complex machines. And yet for us, we open the door, we sit down, we turn it on, and we drive away, right? That's not, a car is not simple, right? But it's something that's very complex that we understand how to use. All right, so let me just show with some examples what I consider, for me, have always worked as principles of usability. Um, and I'm gonna do them in the order of importance. All right, number one, functionally correct. I kind of ranted about that already, right? Functionally correct means it does what the user expects it to do or what they need to do. If it's a banking app, I better be able to go in and check my bank balance, right? Stuff like that. Let me show you this example. Um, here is, a, here is a, a conversation. It can be on Slack or Skype or whatever. And you're talking to someone and you say, um, you know, can we meet tomorrow on Skype to discuss? Sure, I'm open all morning. Okay. How about 10 o'clock? Perfect, talk to you later. Now, in a way, this is functionally correct. You have set up a meeting, you've picked the time. Both people have agreed to it. What's wrong with this? <coughs> well, our, our, so forgetting about the semantics of the bubbles, but I mean, just like, what is missing from this conversation? PM or PM. Exactly, well, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> but you're missing time zone. Right, and, and we've all experienced this. I mean, maybe you haven't, but I've experienced this over and over again. And I have reached a point now, whether it's on email, a phone call, whatever, chat, I follow up everything with great, talk to you at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern, which reminds the person I'm talking to, I'm not in the same time zone you're in, right? And we're gonna talk on Skype, and if you don't have my Skype ID, it's this, right? I mean, no one uses Skype anymore, but anyway. <laughs> Right, and this is an example of being error tolerant. You're not making anything more difficult to use. You're basically following up a conversation with, I acknowledge that you've accepted my meeting and just as a refresher, right, to do, to do, to do, that kind of thing. So error tolerant is how well um, errors are prevented, detected, identified, corrected. If you do these two things really well, people will put up with crappy UIs, bad looking graph. I mean, they'll put up with all kinds of stuff. You gotta get these two right. And when we do product design, the longer I do this, the more time we spend on, you know, you've heard the phrase customer journey mapping and all this stuff, but as a programmer, I always just called it workflow diagramming. I mean, we, we spend more time on workflow diagramming, way more than probably we do actually coding the front end because you really gotta get it right. You have to get the features right, you gotta get the error cases right, and you wanna understand all that as much as you can before you commit resources to writing code. All right, so you've gotten these two things right. And then going back to our um, principles of usability, uh, the next three are what look like conflicting goals, right? Efficient to use, easy to learn, easy to remember. Those are like three axes in a 3D model, right? Um, Easy to, efficient to use, let's say you work in a call center and you're taking 100 calls an hour and you're inputting in a little bit of data and moving on to the next call and the next call and the next call and the next call. And as someone that's done um, UX design for call centers, they don't even want to pick up their mouse. I'm telling you, they, they, they're sitting in front of a Windows PC with a big screen and they have their windows arranged so they can just alt tab in between them. 
alt tab, type type, alt tab, type type, enter. If they have to pick up their mouse, they get agitated. I mean, that's how fast they're moving through there. But that's not the same thing as easy to learn. Easy to learn like an ATM. The first time you go to use an ATM, I mean, you probably don't really pay attention to it, but I mean, it will walk you through everything. Put in your card, enter your PIN, you know, da 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 da, right? That's an easy to learn system. And then easy to remember um, is a tough one. And easy to remember comes into play if you're building a complex app that maybe you only use once a month. Maybe only once a month you go into your bookkeeping system and generate invoices for your clients. And you're like, oh, how does that work again? Right? And if you feel like you have to relearn it from scratch every time you go into it, then you've kind of dropped the ball on that one. And you have to find out where your product or service fits on those three axes between efficient, easy, and, uh, easy to learn and easy to remember. That's kind of the next challenge. And then the last one is the one that Unfortunately, people tend to associate more with user experience design than any of the other ones, which drives me crazy. Um, oh, sorry, I got, I got ahead of myself. So an example on efficient to use. So here's a slide. We've all seen slides like this one. I've spent a lot of time looking at this slide, and I honestly don't know what that slide is trying to tell me. It, it's a bunch of data, right? We've all seen slides like that. Hang on a second, I got to... <laughs> We've all seen slides like that, and the people that make them are usually impressed with them. They've done studies on this. Um, overwhelmingly, when people give a presentation, I mean like 90% of the time, they believe that it was a great presentation and everyone understood everything, even if it was a total disaster. And that kind of thinking creates a slide like this. There's no clear point, way too much detail. Uh, visually cluttered, but yeah, I mean, it's efficient. There's a ton of data on there, but what are you gonna take away from that slide? I mean, nothing. Here's an, a counter example where we're only making one clear concept, one in three. So you have a very strong visual image of three women staying next together, they're wearing red. Everyone associates red with heart disease, I mean, or heart, right? And they're basically one in three, women's death, heart disease. There's only one concept in there. I'll let you in on a secret. When you're designing a UI, you want to use a similar uh, mode of thinking for every screen. I try to not have more than one concept or one piece of data input or one decision that you have to make more than one on a screen, especially on these, right? More people are doing stuff on these than on these, and there just isn't the real estate, right, to overwhelm them with all this stuff. One clear concept, simple clear language, simple visual design. Now it doesn't present nearly as much data, right? But odds are you would remember this slide on a presentation, which is the important thing. All right, let me show you another example. Efficient to use, but cognitive load. So this is a, the office space, where the place where we uh, lease office space has a common area with some microwaves in it, right? And they thought it'd be great to put restaurant grade microwaves in there, high duty cycle, right, all that stuff, with just a keypad on the side. So <laughs> for months, I'd go in there with my little can of <coughs> little thing of soup, right, microwave for one and a half minutes, and then I would go, uh, three? No, that's 30 seconds, stop. Four? No, that's four, you know. And I would, I would go through this thing two or three times. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore, and I said, why don't, why don't we just create a sticker for the side of this thing? <laughs> And we mapped out, we did this, we put them in all the microwaves in the building. We were like, why don't we just map out, right, what the presets are and just stick them in there. And the interesting thing about that is it doesn't do anything to change the efficiency of the device, right? But you're eliminating all of the cognitive load. You still have one clear concept, it's still simple, clear language, and it's still efficient to use, but now it's easy to remember. Um, actually, you don't even have to really remember anything. You just look over here and go two minutes, seven, done, okay? I should. <laughs> I should get a discount on my lease. <laughs> All right, now we get to the last one. The last one, subjectively pleasing, right? And um, when you tell people you're a user experience designer, they think about, oh, I mean, you do design like those beautiful white boxes that Apple products come in, and oh, do you, you know, do you do apps and stuff like that? And most people do associate the design element with subjectively pleasing. How the audience feels about the content. And what aspects of it are subjective? 
Um, you have attention to aesthetics and detail, right? I call that it's clear, like we saw on the, uh, the heart disease slide. Follow basic layout principles, right? It's relaxing to look at. If you talk to a trained graphic designer, especially someone that comes from the print world, you know, they are inundated with, you know, teaching on how to do good layout and presentation so that things are relaxing. Responsiveness to user input, right? The user feels like they're in control. Uh, a gentleman this morning gave a fantastic presentation on tricks you can use um, in the UI and your apps to make them feel more responsive. That stuff matters, that stuff's good. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is know your audience, okay? You have to know your audience and meet your audience's expectations, even if what you're creating doesn't, isn't something you personally like. You ready? Drudge Report. So this is one of the most heavily trafficked websites in the world. And this is an example of what we call brutalist design or brutalism. Brutalism is like a throwback to the mid 90s when web pages basically had a white background and someone just vomited a bunch of links onto it. <laughs> but, they, but they know their audience. I mean, it is literally, I think, the most trafficked website in the world right now. People go there and they look for, right, oh, yeah, they, that's a bad guy. Well, yeah, that's a bad guy. And then they, you know, they just start clicking on links, right? That's their audience. And the people who don't like Drudge, right, they don't like it for more than just the reason of the content that's on there. They're these people. Huffington Post, right? Huffington Post, uh, alter you know, conversely, is designed more like a magazine, more like a magazine's table of contents. It has a designed hero image at the top, right? That they put in, and he's a popular topic, right, on both of them. And then they have, rather than having just a pile of links, they have uh, abstract abstractions or snippets, if you will, that look more like stories, right? It's much easier on your brain to look at this and feel relaxed than it is to look at this. I mean, this, this site stresses me out every time I look at it. And a lot of it's because of the design. And they like that. You know, they like agitating people. That's kind of the goal. But you know what? These guys like agitating people too. I mean, just look at that hero. Look at that hero image, right? So know your audience is huge. And, and I think Drudge Report is a proof of the fact that you could ignore all principles of design and still have a successful product if you know your audience and you design for that audience. Okay? All right. So I have two different ways we can go from here, um, but not really because the person, um, my coworker, normally she does the visual design stuff and she couldn't make it. So we're gonna go do this one instead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have to just jump to that. It's too bad because she's, uh, she's good at it. All right, six tools you need for UX. Um, so since you guys are software developers, right, and you're thinking, I got to do a little DIY UX, what are some tools you can use? And then I want you, if you think of something while I'm going through this um, that you either want to add or ask about, just throw up your hand. I mean, don't, there, there's not a ton of material here, so this will go quick. All right, number one, uh, video camera and editing software. So I tell people that, um, if your design team is spending all its time up at whiteboards with post-it notes, you know, putting stickers up and moving them around and writing on it, you're not really doing user experience design because there are no users. You should be spending as much time as you can get away with talking to people who are gonna be the consumers of whatever it is you're building and getting ready to deploy. I mean, if I'm thinking in terms of software. Um, and you should try to videotape everything you can get your hands on. And the reason for that is you don't want to be distracted, seriously type, you know, writing down notes when you're interviewing somebody, right? You want to be a good listener. You want to make eye contact. You want to furrow your brow, under, you know, like you're understanding. And you want to really listen and absorb. And then you want to go back and rewatch the video a couple of times later to pick up things you missed. And you really want to watch for, you know, facial cues, body language, things that will tell you that what they're, tell what they're saying to you is not exactly maybe what's going on. I see this all the time. 
And the reason I'm an advocate for using a real camera instead of your cell phone is not so much that they have better lenses. The, the lenses on cell phones are good, um, but they're much better at picking up audio. They usually have a pair of stereo microphones on them, and they're super sensitive. Um, and then a couple bring two tripods, right? One that you put on a floor so you can position. Ideally, what I will do is if someone is sitting at their desk and using an application, I'll set the tripod up behind them so I can kind of get them, their face, and the screen all at the same time if I can, you know, get away with it. And then, you know, pick your favorite um, editing tools. And then you want to create highlight reels. So you're interviewing somebody, you're asking them questions, you know, I mean, there's a whole, I could do a whole hour top thing just on this, you know, interviewing people and whatnot, but capture as much as you can and create highlight reels that you then show to people to make your point, right? And the big part of it is, is have you guys ever heard the phrase, I think, when you're in a design meeting? Oh, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. Or how about this one? I think what customers want is this. I think what customers want is that. If you go out and interview customers and you video it, right, put a highlight reel together, then it becomes, well, what we've observed is this, right? And it's very powerful. It's very convincing. Um, so anyway. Everybody here heard of Sun Tzu? Has anybody read The Art of War? Okay, I didn't, I mean, I've never read it either, but he has a, uh, I mean, I just, you know, kind of made fun of it a little here a little bit with every UX battle is won before it's ever designed. He has a great quote that says, um, uh, strategy without tactics is the longest road to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And I tell people that, um, design without user research is the noise before failure. You got to talk to your customers. Art supplies. All right, so I know I just kind of ranted about post-it notes, but they, they really are good. I have boxes of them back at my office. And uh, what I like to do with them is use them to engage stakeholders, right? So you're talking to stakeholders, right? Whether, you know, product management, the development managers, you know, whatever it'll be. And what I like to do is throw out uh, a bunch of Sharpies and a bunch of Post-it notes and say, show me how the system works today. And that, that's usually all it takes. Pretty soon everybody is up out of their chairs and they're putting Post-it notes up on the wall. This is a real one from a session we did at the Mayo Clinic. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, it starts here and this happens and, you know, and then you can kind of guide them along the way. And it's a great way to understand how a current system works, right? Because if you just ask someone to tell it to you or you say, do you have any documentation that describes how the current system works, right? The answer is usually, yeah, but it was written five years ago and it's all out of date. The people who really understand how it works can go in there and do this kind of stuff. But it's just, it's great, it's a great tool for team collaboration engagement. Everybody feels like they're really, you know, collaborating, working together, you know, all that stuff. Um, and the same thing goes with sketch pads. When you reach a point where um, you want to start drawing out some solutions, maybe you want to do a little, some work flowing and stuff like that, I have big sketch pads that I bring, put down on the table. I find for reasons I don't understand that they work better than whiteboards. If, it's like if I put a big sketch pad down in the middle of the table, everybody kind of leans in and they grab a marker and then they want to start annotating, right? If you do it at the whiteboard, the whiteboard is, people feel like it's like every, you have to wait your turn, right? Whereas with the sketch pad, people will just, you know, grab and go. All right, diagram software. So you've been talking to users, you've started kind of collecting some uh, information from your clients on how this sort of thing works, you're trying to understand the current system. What I like to do is, I like to start first by diagramming out, is this what you mean by how the system works today? And we, we use Omnigraphle on the Mac for that, we, we like it a lot, but Visio on, a, on Windows is just as good. We've actually created uh, Omnigraphle stencils that we use for this. You can download them from crutch.com, they're there for free, um, to help us uh, do this process. And I like a digital tool for this because it, it gets complicated quickly. Um, I, I've had these you know, diagrams turn into 100 pages of stuff, right? Just trying to understand like the happy path of the flow through the system. And then later you're gonna go back 
and say, this is how we're going to change it, improve it, enhance it, add on to it. And then you're going to go back in and do failure mapping, right? And failure mapping tends to be like an order of magnitude larger than the happy path mapping. What are all the things that can go wrong, right, at different spots? And how do you want to map that out? And I had this trick that I came up with a long time ago, um, which is I would create groups of func functions with like a, I call them series, like series, you know, series 400 of screens. And this is an example of like, you know, onboarding, right? So 400, onboarding, 410, you know, profile set, you know, whatever. And then when you're having conversations later with the stakeholders, developers, or whatever, you can talk about, I want to look at screen 430. And everybody can kind of sort of immediately go to, oh yeah, for screen 430. And then we organize our collaterals the same way. All right. Wireframing tools. So a lot of different ways to do this. Wireframing is basically, um, okay, we've done kind of our journey mapping, we've done some diagramming and all that, and we kind of know how we think we want this to go together. Let's talk about what some screens might look like. And these are, these are representative samples. You, you don't need to wireframe out the entire application, right? But it's a good place to start. Um, and again, uh, we like to use paper sketch pads for on-site, but we have recently just completely migrated over to iPad Pros just because it's so much easier to share the material and it's so much easier to edit. Problem with sketch pads is you, you draw all this out and it's like, oh, I, I want to make this change over here. And then do, do I have to go back in now and like redraw, you know, five other wireframes? It's just so much easier to, to sort of do that thing digitally. Um, and for interactive wireframing, um, we use two tools. Has anyone here used uh, Azure RP or even heard of it? Heard of it? It's a, it's a decent tool for doing um, interactive stuff. We do that when we want to test a human interaction model because you, it's easier to like animate things, make things move, respond to data input, whatnot. So Azure is good for that. Otherwise, we mostly use uh, Adobe XD, which kind of fits well into this category. Oh, lots of people use Sketch. It's a super low fidelity to UI right. that's right in the middle, and it's free. Right. Sketch is, I don't think Sketch is free. It's not Sketch, I apologize. Envision. Envision, you right. Push, yeah. You can use a lot of right. things to push to Envision. Right. But Envision is super easy too. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. We sort of standardized on Adobe XD because we'd already have a, you already have a license for it, and it's like, I don't want to pay for another thing. Totally. Yeah. But if you're like just doing it yourself sometimes, I mean, have a low budget. Well, the lowest budget way, <laughs> the lowest budget way that, that we've done this is basically just using um, Evernote Sketch on an iPad. Yeah, that works actually pretty well. It's not bad. Um, and then, of course, Illustrator and Photoshop. And what you really are doing at this stage is you're, pr you're providing a visual language, right? It's like, let's just, let's grab some representative example screens, right? I call it, a, I call it core sampling. You, you've got this system or this application which is, Maybe pretty deep. Well, we're not going to sit down and draw storyboards for the whole app, right? We'd be here all year. But let's just take like a vertical core sample, which goes from beginning to end of a particular Happy Path user experience, and let's draw that out and see what that looks like and get feedback from end users, like through an informal user test or from stakeholders. I find Adobe XD works really well for that. Um, you can have all the different regions clickable and then they move to a different screen. It, what it doesn't handle is data entry. That's the sad part. So if you're gonna do something that uses a lot of data entry, then Azure works really, really well for that. And eventually though, you'll have to do some drawing. So whether you use Illustrator or Photoshop, it kind of depends on people's preference. Um, bonus tool. So if you, ha has anybody here used 3M's visual attention software or even heard of it? Have you guys ever heard of eye tracking? <laughs> 3M's VAS is an algorithmically driven eye tracking tool. You can take any image, load it up on their site, analyze it, and it will come back with a heat map. There's different versions of the heat map. They will show you where people's eyes are likely to go within the first five to 10 seconds. They will show you the order in which they will visually scan an image. and um, we use this now for everything. Pretty much everything we do, we run through heat mapping. And uh, we've, we're always impressed with um, how small differences can have a big impact right in the page that you're designing. 
And real eye tracking is time consuming and expensive, right? You can get a piece of software and you can sit someone down in front of the laptop and the camera will monitor their eye movement and it'll produce something similar. But the problem is you have to get a fresh test subject every time, right? And I don't wanna use those resources until we're close enough where we feel like we have something we're ready to deploy, then I, I wanna bring in real people and test it. While we're doing early exploration of the visual language, I just throw it up on VAS. It's like $49 a month. Do you find, like, anecdotally, does it match up pretty well to what you would normally do? Like, when you're looking at that same image, do you find that it does a pretty good job of, like, correlating to where you look first and how long you spend on each part? For me, the, the, what I use, well, all right. So we've used it for different things. What, what I personally really like it for is if I'm building a UI and I want to make sure a con, like an actionable control mm -hmm. doesn't disappear into the UI, I want to make sure that it's, it's a hot spot. Okay. Because I, I'm just here to tell you, I have, done, <laughs> I have done enough UI development and user testing to know that you don't really know how that's going to come out until someone sits down and you're just standing there like going, oh my God, just click it, <laughs> right? And they don't see it. They just don't see it. And then you, you run it through uh, a heat map thing and, and, and it's ice cold. And it just, it does, it just works. So I don't do everything now goes through this just to make sure, you know, we want people to see these alerts. And it, it does, it, it drives our design. So in areas where we really want to call attention out, we make sure that, you know, it's, it's a bold, actionable button surrounded by a lot of white space and if necessary, you know, use an obnoxious color. All right, HTML, CSS, JavaScript tools. Um, you guys know more about this stuff than I do. I, you know, um, we use Visual Studio Code because, honest to God, we do everything now in JavaScript. I mean, everything. It's like other languages don't exist for us anymore because pretty much what we're doing mostly is front-end coding, and that pretty much means HTML, CSS, JS. And, and the thing that's gotten frustrating for me um, is there's a new CSS framework every five minutes, and I, I just I can't take it anymore. And we have kind of standardized. We, we're big fans of material, Google's material design. We use it pretty much wherever we can. Um, and so there's a good CSS framework called Materialize that works with that, but most of the time we just use Bootstrap 4. I mean, it just kind of works. And then we'll use Angular 2, right, to connect into the back end and rinse and repeat. And we've also gotten really um, good at doing a lot of prototyping just by throwing together a quick node server on the back end with some canned data. But we've even stopped doing that, and we've started just doing everything with Lambda services on AWS because you can prototype that environment so quick, it's ridiculous. And then going live from that is like flipping a switch. And that's it. I see a lot of nodding heads, that's good. So bonus tool, um, anybody here use Zeppelin.io? Did it change your world? It, it did. Pretty cool. I don't know, I'm a front end guy, so. Yeah, you're a front end guy, exactly. That's cool. The magic of Zeppelin is this. In the old days, and by the old days, I mean like two years ago, <laughs> um, you would do a design, right? And you had two choices, one choice was the designer would just sit down with the developer and you know they'd start mocking up you know CSS stylings and build some sheets um, or you would take a bunch of static storyboards that you did with you know the previous tools Photoshop Illustrator whatever and you'd either throw them in InVision or put them on a hard drive or whatever right and you give it to the development team and go here you go right and then the first development iteration comes back and you go what is that right because it's like, well, a font's a font, right? Mm -hmm. Arial, Sophia Pro, what's the difference? Uh, red, green, blue, I don't know, I'm colorblind. Works for me. And so you, you, go, you go into this death spiral of the designer going, no, 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 no. This needs to be you know, left aligned, right? And it goes on and on and on. And then eventually you run out of time. And then you just have to throw up your hands and go, it is what it is. Great is the enemy of good. And the developers get frustrated, right? And everybody gets frustrated. All that went away with Zeppelin, all of it. Because Zeppelin gives the developer the least path of resistance. What it does is we, you can export right out of XD. Your, your artboards in Adobe XD go right up into Zeppelin, and it auto-generates the CSS styling for colors, font styles, layers, everything. And all they do, <laughs> they bring up their web browser, 
And you, I know it's hard to see, but they, they've clicked on like a little icon here. And it, it just gives you the, the CSS for it. It will give you uh, SVG or PNG collaterals out of the whole thing. Remember the old days? You'd get a design and you'd get the email. Yeah, I don't have Photoshop. So I need those logos, and right? You don't do any of that anymore. Now they just go into Zeppelin and they go click, 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 copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, right? Done. And since we have started using Zeppelin, <laughs> I mean, the designer developer iteration, you know, there is some of that still, right? Because, but in most cases, it's the interaction model isn't quite right or something's not working quite right, but we don't ever have to do iterations anymore on appearance, ever. It's just, that's just, that's gone. So really, I, I just can't recommend this tool more highly. Yeah, so there, there is this sort of um, this unicorn mythology of if only the designer could code, right? And they could just build the front end and it would look just right. But the problem with that is the reason I don't like, I mean, okay, that, that sounds bad. I, not, I don't like, but the reason I don't encourage that really on my team is I don't want the designers to worry about how hard something is to implement. If you're really designing for the end user, you're focused on delivering this, you know, this thing, which is precisely designed. And I know from my own experience of doing both the design and the implementation piece that I start immediately thinking about, oh, you know, what I really want to do is this, but I know that's going to be a lot of work. So, right? And I just, I'd rather, I would rather do it from a design standpoint the way we want to do it. And the other thing is, um, as a practical matter, it is getting so hard to keep up with design, right? Design is changing. Well, I mean, the, what, like, what sort of standards and practices are changing, um, the design languages, right? Material and all, you know, all the other ones are constantly evolving, right? And you have to keep up with that stuff. That's time consuming. And then trying to keep up with everything that's going on with JavaScript and HTML and CSS I just, I don't know if one person, I know I can't do, I can't do it. I don't know if one person can really stay on top of all of that at the same time. That's just my, my opinion. That's it. Questions? No questions? Oh, NNG? It's literally just NNG.com. I think it's .com. Do you have these slides available somewhere? Um, I can make them available. I'm not sure. Um, if, if, you, if you go to my website, which is listed you know, here, Don, I know you can't read that, but it's just crutch.com. If you go there, I'll put them up there. I'll just burn them off as a PDF or something and throw them on there and you can download them. Yeah. Yes. So the toughest problem you tried to solve or solve it? The toughest just problem. Uh, you mean like design problem? User problem. Um, all right, I'll, I'll tell you the toughest thing I've had to do from a design standpoint, and this isn't, uh, since you guys are all software developers, this might not be complimentary, but um, I, I did this uh, project many years ago for a storage area networking company, and I led the design of what turned out to be an award-winning um, enterprise SAN management console. All right, so when I started this project, the engineering team um, had a Swiss Army knife slash kitchen sink approach to the console. It had 100 million features in it, right? Uh, I could tell you stories you wouldn't even believe. And um, so we, we embarked on this user study, right? And we spent, I'm not kidding, we spent six months talking to um, current customers, prospects, customers who have left the company, right? I mean, hundreds. Went through this whole thing. And we came back with the what shouldn't be an astonishing conclusion, which is customers are only really using about 10% of the product. Right? It's a storage area network. What do you want to do with a storage area network? Well, I want to create a volume and I want to map it to a server. 
the end. I mean, pretty much. It, obviously, there's more to it than that. There's replication and right snapshotting, and there's da 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 da. But in the end of the day, that one thing was what they wanted. And um, so I had to then go back to the development team and, and say, you know that fish scaler that's on the Swiss Army knife that no one ever uses? We're going to get rid of the fish scaler. And we're going to get rid of the, oh, I'm out of time. And, uh, da, 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 da. and the most difficult problem I had to solve was fight the entire engineering organization and convince them that we're going to build a next generation version of this thing. It's going to be a lot smaller, but in the end, it's going to be more powerful than what you have now. That was hard to do. You know, what I ha one of the ways I solved that problem was um, uh, I, I brought in a vendor that was trying to build a solution on top of the product, very skilled software developer, um, and had him present to the engineering team just how hard it was to build a service that could connect to this thing and why this is a disaster. Right? I had to do that. I had to then take some of them out to Microsoft. At the time, Microsoft was our largest customer. Take them into the storage lab and have the uh, storage architects there explain what they actually do. I mean, it, right? it was heavy handed and we had to spend a lot of money. But at the end of the day, we got it done and we did. We, we won a, like, all the Editor's Choice Awards and storage magazines that year and, and blah, blah, blah. And it was, it, was, it was a big hit. But solving the design problem was nothing compared to solving the culture problem within the organization. I see a lot of nodding heads. You guys have all experienced this. Yeah. You have to be a good salesman, salesperson. Just to understand well microphone. You do. One more? Real yes. Quick, uh, could you go over maybe some like the most common examples that are easiest to fix or to do what people are always doing in user design or mistakes maybe? Um, I think the most common mistake that people make well, the number one mistake people make is um, working in a vacuum with a group of designers and developers without talking to customers. That's, that's number one. Get out, get out into the field, and I always say get out into the field and rap to these people. Find out what it is they're doing with the product, what they really need, right? And then just focus on that. I, I describe it as throw everything you can out of the lifeboat, right? We don't have infinite resources and people and da 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 and uh, you guys all Agile practitioners? So what is the basic concept of Agile, right? Cut this thing down into small little pieces with rapid iterations and customer feedback and all of that. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's it. I mean, getting people to, to just stop thinking about the fish scaler. <laughs> and it's like just focus on something small that's deliverable that makes an improvement. And you know, you'll develop momentum on your own just doing that. That all of a sudden everybody's gonna want to be on your project, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.